Thank you so much. Uh, it is just a real joy to be with all of you. So appreciate it. Um, so I started working on ancient Greek networks in 2010. At that time, it was difficult to find good software for myself. There was UCI Net, which is difficult to learn on one's own, and Payek, which required matrices instead of edgeless, which was uncomfortable for me and did not suit my uh, very small data sets. Um, I wasn't yet aware of Gephi, which was also released in 2010, but nearby at the University of Maryland, uh, a group was uh, developing NodeXL. And I went and talked to them. I live in Maryland as well um, to see if it might work for me. My first experiment was to map the relationships I saw in Plutarch's Life of Pericles. It's about 40 pages long. Uh, the technique of extracting pairs of names worked beautifully, but the results were not very interesting. I expanded to try the social network of Alexander the Great, which became my first publication in 2012. Let me see, I'll show you some images of these. So this is um, Pericles, which was eventually uh, published in uh, the Journal uh, for Historical Network Research, as we just as um, Ingeborg explained. Uh, here, I made it more interesting <laughs> by highlighting the women and uh, their role in binding uh, the families together. Uh, but then, let's see, uh, do I have Alexander? Uh, I, in 2015, uh, published the social network analysis of the Amarna letters. These are tablets clay tablets from the Bronze Age Pharaoh of Egypt to his vassals and other state leaders. Um, and for about five years, I was working on the social network of Socrates, which you can see on the left side. Uh, and that was um, that appeared in the um, Center for Hellenic Studies reports, which was um, an online journal, which works beautifully, right, for, for the gifts, for the motion, for being able to zoom in online publication really works for me and that was in 2019 the social network of alexander i mentioned is 2012 and that you see on the top right um, the sine wave as you know doesn't really show much it's not very useful for analysis but it reminds me of alexander's hair <laughs> And so I put it in uh, and then in the lower right, as I said, I was so unhappy with uh, Plutarch's life of Pericles that I decided to see what he looked like inside the network of Socrates. So um, that became uh, that study published in 2019. And the project I have going now is on um, the potters and painters of the archaic uh, vases from Athens, and this is a collaborative project with Eleni Hasaki of the University of Arizona, and the top band, I know it's difficult, but it is possible to zoom in, um, shows the black figure vase painters and their relationships basically through style and through shapes of vases. Um, and in that, on the right blue, you can see we had uh, at that point 595 vertices or, or nodes and 767 edges or, or ties or links. Uh, the project I want to talk about today is a simpler one because it's more conceptual and it uh, appeared in 2020 just a few months ago uh, and it's part of a conference uh, I participated in in Manchester in 2018 called The Entangled Sea, which is where the title comes from, The Entangled Sea. And uh, so I want to explain to you how I created this kind of hybrid map. I call it a field map where you have people and their activities like fishing, places like roads or ports, um, things like olive oil or cargoes, 
And then these fields, economic infrastructure, transportation, which are the subjective part. Uh, so let me just <laughs> launch in, so to speak. So I take as my launch pad for this talk, launch ramp, um, this uh, poem by Odysseus Elitis, Greek poet, who said, if you deconstruct Greece, in the end, you will be left with an olive tree, a vineyard, and a boat. Today, I am sharing with you a description of how I mapped uh, the relationships that make olive oil, wine, and the boats part of the same system. I use networks to think about the social, religious, economic, technological and material ties lubricated uh, by wine and olive oil and seawater, which connected farmers, workmen, merchants, sailors, traders, and consumers, in other words, human beings, with olive trees, grapevines, and the boats which carried them to far off ports and customers in the classical period. All three, the olive tree and the grapevine and the boat, need human energy and attention to maximize their dasein, their being in the world. I hope to show that the making and consumption of oil and wine and the making and use of boats embedded in ancient Greek life can be understood as created creating a field of experiences that both stabilized ancient Greek society and allowed for fractal replication throughout the Mediterranean in colonial migrations. Allow me to provide just a little background before we get into it. Um, in, the, in the period beginning in 730 BC to about 600 BC, the Greeks began to leave mainland Greece and create colonies, these fractals of their home cities called a metropolis. These were autonomous from the start, having to create their own trade networks and treaties with local communities. And many of these developed to be larger and wealthier than their mother city. They settled everywhere you see in red, Spain, France, Italy, Croatia, Albania, Libya, Cyprus, Anatolia, then up through the Dardanelles, what they called the Hellespont, to Istanbul, and then the Black Sea region, including settling in Romania, Bulgaria, the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine, the coast of Georgia. So if we ask, where was ancient Greece? We would say, wherever people lived a Greek life. There was no country called Greece. It was an idea, it was a culture. Every Greek polis shared a common culture. The Greeks called themselves Hellenes. Wherever they lived, Hellas. Greek culture included their architecture, sport as the center of their daily life, drama, polytheism, love of stories, the arts. The, Greeks val the Greek values one would find in every polis one visited would ideally include hospitality, philoxenia, autonomy, openness to new ideas, to new people, to trade. We might add resistance to tyranny and free speech. They were known for cleverness, intelligence, and inventiveness rather than brute strength. Each city protected its own territory so that we use the hyphenate city-state to translate their word polis. Our word politics, their politica, are the things having to do with the polis. Each could be democratic, oligarchic, monarchic, or a combination, always self-governing and independent. Greek cities were never united into one country until conquered by Alexander the Great and his father, Philip of Macedon. In all Greek cities, olive oil production tended to involve an entire community, 
behaving in a self-organizing system on a seasonal basis. Networks of ancillary businesses provided services for the olive oil industry. It might involve making baskets or nets or pots or providing wood for carts and caring for pack animals. Once picked, the olives change day by day in the acidity of the olive oil that will come from them. Producers could not wait too long for the pots to arrive at the mill. These nested interdependent networks to process the olives worked as one. In this season, the humans were anticipatory, reacting as one. The ancient Greeks self-organized to keep oil flowing in their communities. The complex adaptive system was constantly learning and adjusting through feedback loops. Pruning vines and planting olives are technologies that had to be taught and cultivating and processing these plants were part of their traditional folk knowledge shared by the community and passed down to the young. Technologies are developed through activities with things, part of social practices. And by habitually doing these activities in traditional folk ways, one leads a Greek life. For the ancient Greeks, using olive oil in every facet of life made the Greeks dependent on traditional practices required for the agricultural growth, harvesting, processing, and trading and social usage of the olive and the grape. The Greeks were dependent on oil, demanding more of it. The ships which brought these commodities to cities which could not make enough for their own consumption were vital to maintaining the Greek lifestyle. Another way to view it is to say life without access to olive oil and wine was not a Greek life. My view is that relational thinking is key to understanding the ancient Greeks. I use sociograms to show that olives, grapes, and boats were linked to each other through people, human behaviors and activities, including the economic, technological, religious, and social fields, and the human body. In this visualization, we have a multimodal network of 62 entities, which are people, places, and things, and abstract fields. There are four different classes, in other words, rep represented here. Blue are things. The orange nodes are humans or human activities, which are entangled with these things. Dark red are places or spaces, and the purple in capital letters are the fields. Each place, human activity, or thing can be part of multiple fields and plays a role there, sometimes major or minor. So now let me explain how I am using this word field as a layer of interpretation over the more empirical mapping done by making edge lists from historical sources. I have labeled the fields I saw as economic, religious, technological, body-centered, and the social here. The labels for the fields are my own after studying the links in the edge lists between the things and the human activities. So the 62 vertices and their 240 edges came from the primary sources that attest to the link. I use the concept as developed by Bourdieu, specifically the idea of fields for human social engagement in which there are norms and rules. The fields are attributes that we assign to the three classes of nodes, an act of interpretation we include in the visualization. The humans 
places and things come from our source data, but the fields are subjective, are added after the other classes have been rendered into a different sociogram and analyzed. So let us walk through a simple example together. Think of an ancient Greek woman, a priestess, holding a gold libation bowl called a fiale for performing the ritual of pouring wine at a ceremony at an altar. This is a culturally constructed image which Greeks would interpret just as we did. Now we are ready to make our edge list from this archaeological evidence of this drinking bowl. So here we have a priestess and a fiali, wine and a fiali, libation ritual and wine, libation ritual and fiali, priestess and altar, libation ritual and altar, libation ritual and priestess. Okay, so we look at this a bit. We're ready now to add the attributes of the fields. And these are subjective based on our own contextual knowledge. The first one that comes to mind is religion. The ritual is part of a set of formal coded behavior with recognizably religious things in religious places and settings with human behaviors. The place is an altar, a sanctuary here. The things are a wine and the fiali. Priestesses don't live at shrines. They have to travel there. So you see I'm adding travel as a field along with the two modes she probably took, a wagon and a boat. Deliberately adding the fields after looking objectively at my edge list and its product, product made me think of the way the priestess got to the sanctuary and the context for her ritual, which is praying on behalf of a community, thus social. I developed this field map to explore the many ways Greek identity and the continuity of Greek culture was entangled with the practices around material culture, especially olive oil and wine. Making and using olive oil, making and using wine, tending the olive trees and the grapevines are entanglements on land. And making and using boats and ships to trade, barter, and share these as commodities can be understood as an intricate network of interactions and associations entangled with the sea. So this was my first experiment to help you understand again my method. Let's take this early field map. I was only working on olive oil at this time and having gathered and read the primary sources, the hundreds of ancient Greek mentions of olive oil by Greek authors, I began to think about human olive oil place relations. The fields emerged as I began to place the nodes or move the nodes on the sociogram. So this one has just 43 entities with 80 ties between them. So to demonstrate my method, we start with the sources and I'll do this quickly. Uh, here we just have samples of primary sources on olive oil. I collected hundreds of references. And in this slide, I selected a few that associate olive oil with the human activities that are related to the field technology, um, the knowledge applied to making or fixing things. And so we'll look at the bottom, uh, just a very short mention here on the use of olive oil um, for polishing marble. So here it mentions wax melted with olive oil, applied with bristles, and you sort of rub it with waxed rollers and clean linen cloths, and that way marble is given a shine. And when you see many of these, this is a tiny sample that over and over have to do with some sort of technology, the field technology arose for me. 
so I began to see patterns. Uh, and so here we have polishing marble and all these other kinds of technological uses that I found in the sources. And so technology became a node for me. So I would arrange these nodes um, with like and like, moving them, in other words, to cluster them together conceptually, uh, you know, for myself to understand them. Let's try another example. Here, I discovered how oil was related to cleansing practices and bathing after sailing on or swimming in the sea. Uh, related to body and healing and self care. So in the bottom entry, you can see in bold and set about washing themselves and anointing themselves with olive oil. So here, massaging and rubbing and anointing, they all appear very, very frequently, particularly with athletics, but also for this cleaning. And just one more, here we see medical applications for oil and healing the body. We'll just sample the top one on medicines um, that you can see they use it for fractures and for coughs in sweet wine and for sores in uh, medicines, in uh, skin issues. And so um, here's again the uh, field map, medicine. And I put some of these uses there very simply and of course, I went through the same process for wine. So while reading the sources, I made a spreadsheet with two columns, edgeless. Each row is a pair that are linked in some way. And here are some samples, both of what I found in the primary sources and then um, so the fields as well. So I ended up with the 62 vertices and 240 pairs. Now, it also, of course, gives me statistics to help me understand the network as a whole and each individual node's relative importance within the network, but I won't be using these today. I'm not sure how helpful they are in a field map beyond just degree centrality. I would really like your opinion on whether the centrality measures or statistics could help in such a field map or are just too concrete for this conceptual abstract modeling. So this is a brief description of how I build the field map. I would also call it a multiplex network visualization or sociogram, but because I am adding the fields outside of the data collection so that it has a subjective layer of my own interpretations of the ties between the humans, places, and things, I decided to call it a field map. Now I would like to just hit the highlights of what we can learn from seeing all together in one map, people, places, and things in context, namely the fields. First, a little bit more on this association between olive oil and wine in Greek culture. I'm interested in how things, material objects, play a role in binding society together, how the technology and the manufacture of these things plays a role in continuing the unique culture through transmission of embodied knowledge and traditional folkways. To summarize all of the literary evidence, we see the ancient Greeks favoring some wines over others, becoming connoisseurs, describing the aesthetics of flavor, scent, and viscosity, being able to discern an old wine from new or where the wine came from. Olive oil helped men resemble the gods who were also gleaming and shiny and smelled good. Human desire for oil and wine drove the market the complex system of social, technological, economic, and religious actions and practices and beliefs. Thus, the associations for oil and wine did not just include the aesthetic, but also myth, superstition, ritual, status, care for the body through anointing, massage, athletics, and healing, and as prizes. Individuals and city-states used wine and olive oil in gift giving to create or strengthen ties. We think wine uh, today is a luxury maybe we can live without, but the alcohol was antiseptic, taken with every meal, and helped to provide a caloric intake 
to sustain human life, supplementing the diet with up to 600 calories per day. Just for olive oil, we saw in my early field map how dependent the ancient Greeks were on the stuff. They used it in manufacturing, medicine, providing light for lamps, sunscreen, religious rituals, perfume, plus manufacturing, and transporting olive oil was a driver for developing infrastructure such as harbors and ports, good roads, and maintaining trade relationships among the 1,000 plus Greek city-states, so helping keep the peace. Dependencies connected raw materials to processing activities, making and filling containers, transporting over roads and by sea, selling in marketplaces, using things in public and private spaces, ultimately creating a flexible and layered network across land and sea. If we take the time to analyze what was going on inside each field, we see better the entanglements between the people, places, and things. For an example, let's focus on the way the field map helps us understand how Greek people physically encountered oil and wine in and on their bodies, starting with athletics. The tradition of athletics was uh, part of male identity and education and was not complete without olive oil. They massaged oil on their bodies before exercising. They applied it as an adhesive for fine, sa fine sand, which served as a sunscreen and provided friction for the wrestling and boxing. We notice the ancient Greeks used a lot of olive oil for their bodies, for cooking, anointing, rituals, perfume, in baths as the main ingredient in, message, in, in, in medicines. Oil made humans smell better, feel better, and look better. So here we just looked at body healing and we noticed the reach of body in looking at ath athletics and uh, then olive oil combined with it. If we also look at wine, uh, we kind of get the same sorts of things. It connects us to technology, the social and body healing. And then the transport of the wine and olive oil extends us to the left side of the map. Both wine and olive oil are liquids. And so they require containers. In ancient Greece, that would be mainly ceramic jars called amphoras. Each ceramic amphora has a story, an object biography, an itinerary. Many human technological and cultural practices evolved to keep commodities available in their communities. But as demand grew for these things, a kind of entrapment was the result. Entrapment comes about when humans feel trapped in a loop, compelled by demand, to do something and they cannot stop. For example, the more wine a city produced, the more potters, clay, wagons, and kilns were needed to bottle it and transport their amphoras and carry it to more and more ships. The act of making wine requires mass amounts of ceramic containers, forcing humans to continually make these amphoras. A positive effect of entrapment is that the Greek craftsmen transfer their traditional and embodied knowledge to apprentices through the generations. So here I mapped the object itinerary or journey or the possible journeys of one such pot. Starting at the top, working our way down, look at how many humans touched and interacted with this one jar after the potter created it. While the olives are being processed at the top of the uh, graph, in the middle we have the potters providing the amphoras for the next stage, filling them up. Oil in such pots could be sold locally and stay in the community. The oil could be shipped abroad for profit. And finally, when the jar is empty, see the lower right here, it can be recycled and reused and eventually it ends up either underground or underwater where archaeologists discover them on shipwrecks all these 2400 years later. I mention this because 
I want to help you see that inside each node on a field map is an embedded network. Each node contains a world. The amphora and this whole chaîne d'opératoire we just talked about belongs inside this one node in the olive oil field map, the node I called making ceramics to hold it, to hold the olive oil. And the edges, they should not be thought of as still or static lines. They are alive, like fiber optic cables transmitting packets of cultural traditions, folk knowledge, stories, and more through the generations. This is a different field map project I did for a conference in Manchester, the one in 2018 I called the Entangled Sea, and is the article that I shared with you to be distributed before this talk. I made this field map for thinking through the transformations at a network level that an ancient Greek ship undergoes at the moment it comes into port. Again, the whole system we showed in the larger field map just now on olive oil and wine could be embedded inside these two nodes, wine and olive oil. Nothing on the network diagram is more representative of Greek culture than the concept of hospitality here on the right, Philoxenia. Receiving hospitality in each harbor was imperative. Yet it could be difficult for the mariners to clean themselves up as they approached a port to give a favorable first impression to win them customers for the merchandise and hospitality for the crew. Sailing was a filthy and malodorous business. When the mariners reached shore and were able to find shelter on land, they must have experienced strong feelings of gratitude and deep relief such as when Odysseus accepts Nausicaa's hospitality in Book Six of Homer's Odyssey. The Greek social value of believing that every stranger might be a god in disguise and knowing that gods could appear before you in the guise of a beggar helped these seafarers get a meal, a bath, and a bed for the night. To varying degrees, the community on shore might evaluate and size up the mariners on board a newly arrived ship by a relative scale from strange to familiar based on behavior, language, dress, and hygiene. Each encounter was different, beginning perhaps with skepticism, mistrust, and guarded action, and then moving towards civility and even hospitality through the nature of the first minutes or hours of social encounters. If we think of people and things as they were at sea an hour before they dock and compare it to an hour after they disembarked and were walking about on shore, we see the social networks and the assemblages of artifacts, those that were on the boat and those that come with them off on land, those two things are not the same. The ship's very arrival disturbs the port city. When it departs, the cargo on board will be different, having left some things behind in port and taking on new goods and perhaps a few passengers. Just as Heraclitus said, everything is always in flux. One can never step in the same river twice. One can return to a familiar town and find it changed. The humans expand their social networks through the relationships they make with the new people they meet, the meals they share, the hospitality they experience, the memories they make by being together, and the physical things they socially share, loan, sell, and make. Their minds might be expanded through new stories or images. Information the sailors are given or news they overhear might make them alter the original itinerary. So too, the mariners return to the ship personally changed, richer, poorer, wiser, cleaner, with new friends or customers and fresh supplies in their carry-on bags. 
In addition, each seafarer comes on board with a unique set of people in his social network. There is a bit of overlap between the shipmates, to be sure, with people they have in common. But growing up in their, new, in their own neighborhoods and families, each one had social ties that were unique to them as we all do. Take these men who are sailing into harbor. If a crew docked at a new harbor, each one being hosted by a local family or a person he didn't know before, all of their social networks would expand, both the crew and the town folk. Perhaps on a future voyage, when he returns to this place, he looks for this new friend and meets his second degree connections. Now imagine this kind of dynamic change happening at every embarkation and disembarkation at all of these ports on a daily basis. The network of Greek people trading and visiting across the Mediterranean and Black Sea regions reinforced Greek values, customs, and patterns among the Greek city-states, reproducing activities in a self-organizing way as a complex adaptive system greater than the sum of its parts. We imagine ships coming into these ports, bringing in raw materials and finished products, staples and luxuries, inventions and new ideas too. Greeks and non-Greeks met in these ports, sailed to the same places and traded. Day after day, Greeks offered and received hospitality. They consumed and exchanged gifts with others, every day experiencing change. Field maps can provide a way to witness what stays the same in the midst of all this change. What we might observe is how unstructured all of this activity was. From city-states down to individuals, the actors were making their own decisions inside a largely autonomous self-organizing system. Localities participated in building the infrastructure, ordinarily without any external pressure or being ordered or paid to do it. People took out their boats and their ships when they wanted. There was no oversight for developing the Mediterranean as a unified economic superhighway to support and maintain the Greek lifestyle. Given this entangled mix of human activities with places and things and fields, let's now view this as what it is, a complex adaptive system. Patterns of culturally constructed behaviors were met in each port we get the same methods of portage. There would be donkeys and carts, merchants, food and drink, shelter for the night, experts to repair ships, places for crews to get laid. There was the infrastructure needed. They have to maintain ports, build ships, load amphora as cargo, find ways to trade. These interactions, self-organizing, create a larger system, which together is greater than the sum of its parts. This cultural analysis and model of Greek shipping and trade in wine and olive oil has been built on insights that I draw from the theories of materiality, exploring the thingness of things, their life cycles and contexts. Entanglement, seeing how humans and things are codependent. Actor network theory, emphasizing the technological relationships which bring man-made things into the world and the cultural traditions that perpetuate production of these things. Social network analysis, through which we can map these ties and see clusters inside the networks. And finally, complexity theory, which lets us see these interdependencies as part of a self-organizing complex adaptive system. My contribution is to introduce to you the field map, this kind of sociogram where we see these people, places, things, and fields as nodes, each containing nested networks inside of them. The fields are attributes we assign to the three more objective classes of nodes an act of interpretation we include in the visualization. The field maps were also good for thinking through and seeing the patterns to help in my analysis. 
I developed the field map as a way of conceptualizing the entangled entities I could feel but not quite see. It turns out to provide a porthole through which to view the nested networks of entangled things and human activities that worked for me to understand seafaring and the roles of wine and olive oil in the archaic and classical periods. I hope you can use it too to see your people, places, and things in contexts. I thank you for your attention and am now very happy to take your questions and comments.